What's going on, smart people? Sorry to those of you who clicked on this video expecting it to be a sketch. It's not. This is a very serious video today. I don't know why I'm doing this. Uh, a couple of years back, I made a series of videos going over what you can expect each year throughout your undergraduate physics degree. And given the time of year, I know a lot of you finished submitting your applications for grad school, so I thought I'd do a similar thing, talking about what you can expect your first two years of grad school for physics. I should mention that this is for going to grad school in the United States. I have no idea Idea what it's like going somewhere else. Uh, but if you're watching this and you're from a different country and you're a grad student, leave a comment below where you're from and how does what I'm saying compare to your own experiences. That'd be pretty interesting to read and I think that'd be useful information for others. Now before I get into the details of what to expect in grad school, I want to make one piece of terminology clear because I see this question a lot. Namely, what constitutes a grad student? Now in the US, a grad student can be someone pursuing a master's degree, a master's student, or someone pursuing a PhD, a PhD student. Grad student is just the umbrella term that encompasses both. Now the reason I wanted to combine the first two years into one video is because as far as the big stages of grad school go, year one and year two really aren't all that different. You're going to be spending most of that time just taking classes. Now what classes can you expect to take? Well first there's what's called your core classes. These are classes that every physics grad student will probably take regardless of if you're doing a master's, a PhD, if you're going to focus on nuclear or condensed matter, you're all going to be taking the same core classes more or less. And this will be your classical mechanics, ENM, quantum, stat mech, math methods, maybe computational physics. As you may have noticed, these are all topics that hopefully you will have encountered in undergrad. In grad school, you're going to go through them again just in more detail. And some classes more so than others. In my experience, math methods wasn't that much more challenging in grad school as than it was in undergrad. However, E&M was a hell of a lot more difficult than undergrad. Now, in addition to your core courses, your university will probably impose that you take some upper division classes as well. And we'll talk about funding in a little bit, but if you're funded by your research advisor, they will probably push for you to take upper division courses that are relevant to your research. So as an example, I'm doing theoretical nuclear physics, so my upper division courses were high energy physics and quantum field theory. Now, from what I've seen, and this is the case for my university, NMSU, uh, in order to be considered a full-time grad student, you should be enrolled in nine credits a semester. And this seems to be the standard, but I would double check with your university as well. Now, what this means is as long as you're enrolled in nine credits or more each semester, and I don't recommend taking more than the requirement, you should be able to defer your student loans throughout the entirety of your graduate degree, which is awesome. Now, that comes out to about three classes a semester, which compared to undergrad taking five classes a semester may sound like a breeze, but don't worry, I promise you, you will be overwhelmed. Now, depending on the size of your department, these classes may not be offered every year, which means you won't have much of a say on when you take certain classes, you'll take them as soon as they're offered. And as a consequence, you'll have first and second year students taking the exact same class. And this mixing of years is actually a really good thing in my opinion, because one, it introduces you to someone who's been in the department for a little bit longer, and maybe they have some insight into idiosyncrasies of the professor, how they grade, maybe you have to ask them questions in a certain way in order to get a useful answer, things like that. And overall, they can just introduce you to the department. When you're admitted to grad school, your position will likely be funded one way or another. The two common means of funding are through TAs or RAs, teaching or research assistantships. And those titles are pretty self-explanatory. RAs are funded through either their advisor, grants, or fellowships to do research, and TAs are funded through the department to teach and grade. Now, if you're like me and you don't go into grad school already with a research advisor, then you'll probably be a TA for the first year or so. So you'll be responsible for teaching a lab or two, maybe take on additional responsibilities like tutoring if that's something your department offers. And with teaching comes grading. Lots and lots of grading, and it is so easy to fall behind on that if you let it. You can expect to put around two hours per class a week just grading. Maybe more if your lab is particularly lab report heavy. And you can also expect to meet with the instructor on record probably once a week to actually go through that week's lab so that you're going prepared. Although I think we've all had TAs that seemed like they were seeing labs for the first time, so maybe that's not across the board. I personally found being a TA pretty fun and rewarding, and it was good practice for teaching. But once you do have a research advisor, if they have the funding, eventually you will stop having to TA and become an RA 
for the rest of your master's or PhD. Now there are also student fellowships and grants that one can apply for. I don't think it's that common for your advisor to know where to look for those things, but you can speak with other students who are a couple years ahead of you in your realm of research and see if they know where to look. Uh, typically the NSF is a big source across the board, but it's highly competitive. Okay, on to the nitty gritty part of the video. Workload in grad school definitely depends on the culture of your department. Maybe your department adopts more of a grad school is supposed to be shitty, you get through it kind of philosophy, or maybe they place a larger emphasis on the mental health of the students. Listen, I'm not going to pretend to know anything about mental health, and I sure as hell don't know what's best for you, but I do know that you're not going to be successful in grad school if you haven't developed time management skills. One great way to start on that kind of thing is just using a planner or a Google Calendar. I have videos making Google Calendars for my semester that I can link in the description. It's a super, we it's a super easy means of staying on top of things. And I'm not saying that if you're a procrastinator, you're not going to make it through grad school, but that's something that you have to acknowledge and learn to plan for, not just pretend you don't do it and you're going to change this week. In grad school, I think I have very good time management skills, and I still found myself working very efficiently throughout the week and having to give up my weekends and have very late nights to get all my work done. And I think that there's a lot of people out there who would say, if you are as efficient as you say you are, and you're giving up weekends and free time and working late, then you're being overworked and you should say something. And I, I think that that's an example of seeing something gray and insisting that it be black or white. I don't think it's that simple. I was definitely pretty miserable the first year of grad school because of all of the work, but the only reason I was willing to go through it all was because I saw the utility and the problems we were being assigned. Like I'd get to the end of the problem and be like, wow, that sucked, but I see the value in it. If I was pulling all-nighters for busy work, I would have said something. So it really is kind of case by case here, but if like the assignments are unreasonable, or if you just have other priorities this week because you're not in grad school to be a professional class taker, you should feel comfortable going to your professor and communicating these things with them. Maybe they'll give you an extension, or hopefully they'll just at least understand. But it's important that you know that you can speak with your professors about these things. To give a bit of a ballpark figure, I think a good week for people would be spending around like 15 to 20 hours on home work a week. For me, it was always twice that for a couple reasons. One, I hardly ever solved things the smart way. I'd find out the smart way after, so I'd always brute force my way through these problems, which takes longer. So you'll either make it through your classes clever as hell or thorough as hell. For me, it was thorough for sure. Uh, the other thing is, is I typed up my assignments and that wasn't for my professors. That was for me because when it came to doing revisions for exams, it was so much nicer studying, going over old homeworks when they were typed up. I mean, for one, you're not reading scratch here. You're reading actual something that's typed. So it's easier Two, I found myself explaining more and giving like little citations of where I found certain relations. So it made studying just, I saved time studying by tacking it onto my homework time, if that makes sense. Uh, and the third thing that made my stuff take longer is that I always typically just worked by myself, which is one of my only things that I would change in my first years of grad school. It is okay to work with other people in grad school. I'll say it again. You can work with other people on your assignments in grad school. In the real world, you have collaborators. Now, when you work together, I don't think you should say, you do this problem, I'll do this problem. No, I think you should work on the individual problems, all of them, but it's okay to bounce ideas off of each other. At a certain point, you're wasting your time if you're spinning your own wheels for too long. So I, I do encourage that you work with other people. You'll still receive grades for your classes in grad school from homeworks, exams, all that stuff. It doesn't change. And there are a lot of opinions about grades in grad school. You may hear some people say things like grades don't matter, or if you're getting A's in your classes, you're not doing enough research. I think there are little bits of truth in that, but there's a hell of a lot more BS. In my experience, it was easier in grad school to get a B than it was in undergrad and considerably more difficult to get an A. Professors in grad school have a lot of freedom with how they structure their courses. And initially there's this attempt each year to have the same level difficulty exams. But in grad school, these exams are very theory heavy, general equations that you're working with. You're not using numbers and things like that. Maybe you're looking at limiting cases, but you know what I mean. 
And because of that, it's very difficult to have the same level difficulty of exams while changing the problems. So what people will do, what professors will do, is they may say, okay, let's not worry about if one exam is harder than the other, and just get rid of the line by saying, this is always where an A is, this is always where a B is, and let's instead grade on a distribution. That way, year to year, if the exam is harder or easier, it's the distribution that shifts, but as does the definition of A's and B's. And in my experience, the B's, like it was a relatively broad distribution. So if the definition of a B spanned like 15 or more percentage points, you could put in minimal effort and still get a B, or you could put in a lot more effort and still get a B. I still went for A's. Sometimes I was successful, sometimes I wasn't. But in the end, I think it was worth the extra effort for a few reasons. Uh, if, if you slack off too much, you could go on academic probation. You could miss out on scholarship opportunities. And not to mention, if your university has a comprehensive exam, you will be tested all at one time on all of this material anyways. So you're going to put the effort in now or later. I would just rather do it during the actual courses. A lot of what I say should be taken with a grain of salt because, as I mentioned, there's a lot of freedom for grad programs to do things differently place to place, and qualifying exams are no exception. Now, for me, when you get into grad school, I had to take a qualifying exam that was roughly at the level of the undergraduate material on E&M, Quantum, StatMech, and... Uh, classical mechanics. I've made videos on it. I'll leave a link in the description. Once you pass the qualifying exam and you finish your core courses, then you are qualified to take the comprehensive exam, which has a written and oral part. The written part is pretty much the same deal, but all on the graduate level courses that you've taken all at one time. The oral part for me was on like a research proposal. Uh, and once you've passed the comprehensive, then you are a full-fledged PhD candidate. But that's why I say it was worth the extra effort to try to get good grades throughout your courses because it's time saved when preparing for the way more stressful comprehensive exam. Think about it. If it's an exam on four subjects that you spent two years learning, if you give yourself a, an entire month to prepare for it, that's only a week per entire class that you took to revise. So if you're taking good notes with your homeworks and making it legible and easy to go through, you're saving yourself a lot of time uh, for that exam. So I think it's incredibly worth it. To my understanding, most universities have one or the other, qualifying or comprehensive exam. Not so many have both. I think the reason my university does it is because passing the comprehensive exam in the eyes of the university is equivalent to finishing a master's dissertation. So right now, I could sign some paperwork and just get my master's degree, which is pretty cool. But most universities have one or the other. Very few have neither. The last topic is research. Now you're going to do a lot more research once you finish your classes, but you still will probably do some level of research during your first two years. Uh, definitely within the first two years, you should try to pick a research advisor. However, it's important to know that if you go in saying, I want to do nuclear physics, and then you hate it, you can change your mind. You can go to a different group. That's okay. You're not married to that field just because you got into into the program. Your research will probably start with you reading a bunch of papers, kind of learning about what your advisor does. And if you haven't read a lot of research papers before, which is normal, you are in for a pretty steep learning curve. There will be things that you're unfamiliar with that are described in terms of other things that you also don't know, and leaps between logic for different equations that are well established in this other paper that you now also have to read. When you're introduced to a new field, it feels like you're Googling every other word in the paper, but they pop up in like all of the papers. So then in the next paper, you don't have to Google that word or acronym anymore. So it does get a lot better, but I know it can be pretty frustrating at first. When it comes to actual research, your advisor should provide you with some general outline of what you're going to be doing, what your expectations are. And I really recommend trying to schedule regular meetings with your advisor. I prefer weekly meetings. And there you can ask questions, give updates, kind of what you'd expect. Just make sure that you leave the meeting knowing exactly what you're supposed to do for the next week. So before my meetings end, I summarize out loud what I think I'll be doing just in case I'm forgetting anything. I definitely err on the side of documenting everything that I do, typing it up. If you haven't noticed, I like typing things up. I've never regretted it. If I can just copy and paste all of my work of a calculation into a paper, great. If I can't, no harm done. So I really like doing that. There are also lots of workshops and conferences that you'll be able to go to in grad school. And depending on the nature of your funding, there should be something written in, say, the grant allocating some of the funding towards travel expenses for research. 
In other words, you shouldn't find yourself dipping into your own paycheck to go to a conference. Sometimes you may have to pick and choose which ones you go to depending on how much funding is allocated, but you can find out which ones you can prioritize by speaking with your research advisor or other graduate students who are in your field of research to see which ones you should really be trying to go to. Now, if you are a part-time or full-time RA, you can expect to spend anywhere between 10 to 20 hours per week officially doing research, meaning that's what you're going to be paid to do. I find myself, you know, spending some extra time here and there doing it just because I enjoy what I do, but no one's going to make you do that. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. I hope this was informative. I'll talk a lot more about research and things like that when I go over what to expect in third and fourth year grad school. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comment section if you did. Share your perspectives of your grad school experiences as well. And I'll see you guys there.